afternoon, everyone. Um, so I tend to walk a lot on stage. So if I'm not uh, allowing you guys to see anything that you're interested in, just tell me and I'll move out of the way. Uh, okay, so uh, my name is Sebastian. Um, I'm Sebasoga in Twitter, GitHub, and everywhere probably. Uh, I work for a company called Ride, and uh, I came from Colombia, which is that uh, small country that's like darker there on the on the world. So, uh, Colombia has like as any country has a lot of uh, particularities in their in our culture, and some of them are uh, related to our like geographical location. So. Colombia is in South America, on top of South America. You know, in South America, we have the Andes that go from the south to the north. They basically, uh, Andes basically ends where Colombia starts, and then it divides into three, like uh, chains, of, chain of, chains of mountains. Uh, so we have like uh, a lot of valleys between those mount, uh, chains of mountains, and, and like really high mountains too. We even have snow on some of them, although we don't have uh, like winter, uh, we don't have even seasons in Colombia. So, uh, one of these weird cultural things uh, I uh, I mentioned in in Colombia uh, that we have in Colombia comes uh, it's related to this uh, like geography. We I mean not geography, but like the uh, like the way Colombia is influenced by these mountains we have. So, like. M at least two of the biggest cities in Colombia are were built on top of some of those mountains, and that meant that uh, a couple centuries ago, when 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 those uh, regions of the country were being colonized, uh, the only means of uh, that people had to transport like really heavy stuff, uh, uh, such as like construction material and food, or even other people, uh, were basically donkeys. So uh, that that is like a big part of our culture, of our culture, and it has it has like evolved to to some things uh, that are. I mean, it has evolved in a funny way, and I'll I'll just go ahead and tell you why. We have some, something called a burroteca, and a burroteca is something like this. So it's like a donkey plus a discotheque. So you can imagine like a donkey on a rave or something like that playing music. Uh, so this kind of uh, all uh, was, uh, all of this was kind of born because of donkeys transporting stuff to uh, like remote places where there were no roads nor uh, uh, cars, of course, no trains, boats, or any other means of transportation. And someone thought that it was a good idea to also uh, put speakers on a monkey and like take the, take the party everywhere. So uh, later on, when we had, when we had roads and uh, someone decided to import like chassis, uh, car chassis and, and, and an engine, uh, they kind of put something together and that was that ended up being called a chiva, and a chiva, to like nowadays looks like this. It's it. I mean, they they still exist. They we don't use them uh, as, as well as burrotecas. That's something that uh, that we, we don't use anymore. Like it's not something we do on a normal basis. Uh, so chivas are were basically like the first means of transport. I mean, the first cars basically that we had in Colombia that went to remote places, the, the ones I was talking to you about in the mountains, uh, which are really hard to reach. Uh, and on, on those shivas, like, there were a lot of people in there. There were a lot of, like, I mean, people transported their, their food, and, uh, like, you, can, you, you could even see, like, uh, chickens there alive. And it, it, was, it was, like, the way that people got stuff to the remote, re remote places where they lived. So with the chiva happened something similar to what happened to the burro, to the donkey. Someone invented the chivateca. 
So you can imagine what that is. That's a Chiva with a discotheque. So the Chiva was no longer used to transport people and food. It was just used to party. Uh, I actually been like on, on, on those twice and at, I don't like them. It's, there's like too much going on. Like it's, it's a car moving uh, and there's also like people dancing and you're also trying to drink if you don't spill it before you drink it. So it's, uh, it's kind of odd and uh, it actually feels kind of dangerous. <laughs> so I'm talking about this because a lot of times it happens to our applications, to the systems we work on. Uh, they start with an intention and they start with uh, a really defined, clear objective and then as time passes, things degrade and sometimes they, when you're working on, on, on them, when you're working on, on an application, you feel like it's dangerous to, to make any change, even small changes. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about uh, like a system architecture pattern, if we call it, can call it like that, that's based on, based on services. And I personally prefer uh, services. Uh, I think that they taste better in small disposable cups. We're gonna talk a little bit about, about, about more about what that means. So let's start talking about a monolith application or what a monolithic application is. Because I think the word monolith or monolithic has been like uh, given a, a, a bad meaning, uh, a meaning that is not, that's not up to what the word really means because a monolith doesn't have to be a bad thing. Uh, a monolith is different from a like big couple monster application. And I think a lot of people, included myself, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just the only one and you guys don't, but I ended up Relation, uh, like uh, thinking about the monolith, uh, about monolithic applications being a, being a bad thing, uh, just by definition, and that's not the case. the The problem is that a lot of monolithic applications have bad object oriented design, and that does means that an application is going to be a big coupled monstrosity. So. Uh, I wanted to touch base about this before going forward because uh, there's, I mean, like talking about services and microservices, it's like a, it's like, it's like trend. It's, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's what everyone's, I mean, everyone knows, but a lot of people's trying to do. It's, it's supposed to be the solution to the monolith application problem, and it's not, uh, or not necessarily. And it won't, uh, it won't solve your application design problems. So on a talk that was recently gave, I, I'm sorry, I forgot what conference was that. Uh, uh, a guy called Simon Brown said, if you can't build a structure monolith, what makes you think microservices is the answer? And he's totally right. Uh, thinking about services versus monolith applications, it's not like the holy grail. It's not, it's not something that's gonna fix all of your problems. It's just another approach to solving a problem. Uh, so the first problem, I mean, so when we talk about microservices or service-oriented uh, solutions uh, and monolith applications, the first problem we have to solve is something I like to call the boundary problem. And that basically means that if we have a monolith and because of any reason, we can discuss those reasons later, uh, you decide that you want to uh, refactor your application or, or change it or redesign it uh, towards a service, uh, towards a microservice architecture, uh, you won't be able to do it unless you have successfully fix the boundary problem. And what's that? That's basically defining clear boundaries in your system and defining, defining components in your system. And that can be done 
in a Rails application, in a Sinatra application, or in an application in any other language using any framework. Uh, so in order to, do, to fix this problem or to do this to architecture our applications the right way, there are a couple, I mean, there are three principles. I'm only gonna mention the two that I think are useful for this case. They're called the package cohesion, cohesion principles. So the first one is called the common closure principle. And this basically says that all classes that change together should be, should be part of the same package. So basically, if we go back to uh, object-oriented, uh, uh, I mean, to, to principles at the object, this, of the object level, object design level, such as solid, we have this, the silver responsibility principle, which says that a class should have one and only one uh, reason to change. So this principle goes like a level higher uh, to the package level and says that all classes that change because of the same reasons should be, pack should be put together or should be part of the same package. And uh, this is really important because if you want to have services or move towards, towards a microservice architecture, uh, you should really give this a lot of thought. You really want to put class, the, cla the correct classes together because if not, you're gonna be, you're gonna, you're gonna still have the boundary problem even though you, do, you don't have a monolithic application anymore. And the second uh, principle is called the common reuse principle. And this, bas this basically means that you should also put, put together in the same package the class, classes that get reused together. So this goes like a level of, of granularity uh, down, I mean, or goes a level, a level of granularity deeper. And this means that even if a group of classes changes because of the same, change because of the same uh, reason, they should only be put together if they are reused together. If not, there's no need to put them together because then people, people working in your system will tend to, to try to avoid reusing uh, like a big service that does more than you really need to. Uh, so the, like my point with, with presenting you a, uh, representing these principles to you is to explain that in order to move from a monolith to a service oriented, uh, to a microservice uh, architecture, sorry, the first thing you have to, to solve is the boundary problem. And basically you can, you, to create a new service, you, you just take a package or a model that, that's already existing that follow these two principles that we said. And this allows you to easily start, start creating to start migrating for the, from the monolith to a service, to a microservice or into architecture. So sometimes this is not that easy. And a lot of the times you're not migrating from a monolith to a microservice architecture. Sometimes you want to start from scratch with this type of architecture. So this type of principles might be useful, but might not be the best guide when you're starting because you still don't know the reasons for the, the, the reason a class will change or will need to change. Uh, so there are some other ideas or principles that you can use in order to know what things to put together and how to create those boundaries between your uh, services. So another one is just to think about like logical divisions of the problem domain that you're working on. So uh, on, a, on a talk he gave, uh, even Phoenix mentioned that when, if someone asks you to uh, like divide a problem in, in modules or packages and you start writing on a whiteboard, probably the, the first approach you have to doing that is the more natural, is the more obvious uh, approach, uh, way to do it. And it's the way that you should try to start. Uh, because this means that it's, it's intuitive 
the way you're trying to, to separate things. And it might, I mean, it's not a golden rule. It doesn't guarantee that it's going to work, but it's probably a really good starting point. And it is important to know that like uh, perfect is the enemy of good. And although this last principle I just mentioned uh, doesn't guarantee that everything's going to work, it, uh, it shouldn't like uh, constrain you from starting. And you shouldn't be afraid of iterating. You shouldn't be afraid of not getting it right the first time. Uh, because it's, it's hard to do it. It's hard to, to adopt this type of architecture when starting from scratch on a project. So there are some things that work that like adopting this architecture for projects that are, are uh, uh, greenfield or for projects that are where monolith applications before I've seen that should try to avoid. And the first one is like is to never share active record models between services. You should never do that. Uh, it it will lead to a lot of headaches. Uh, even if you try to be really disciplined about maintaining the same the state of the model in equal in all of the services, there's going to be a point where all services are going to have so so much in specific different needs that's going to be impossible to maintain, and you're going to end up having a lot of problems because of it. So the best thing to do. Uh, with models is to only have each model in one service, and that's it. If you either, either if you're migrating from a monolith to a microservice architecture, if you're starting from scratch, always have each model in only one of your services. Uh, another imp another important thing that I've seen while uh, working with microservices, microservice architecture, is that sometimes people try to share stuff such as this active record models or other uh, code that's, that's uh, common to more than one services, service via libraries. And this is normally a bad idea. Uh, because it's, it goes against one of the good things that that this type of architecture brings to you and is that if there's a change on a specific uh, module or package or of, of there, there's a change in a specific business rule, you should only be worried about deploying one specific package or module. If you share code through libraries, that, that means that you'll have to basically redeploy all the services that use that library. So you will be losing a lot of independence. And another thing you definitely need to avoid is, the, is something that's called the Conway's Law. And basically, the, Con the Conway's Law uh, says that if you're working in an organization that's generating a system, the system you're generating will try to emulate or imitate the same structure that the organization has. And this, and this uh, is why we have systems where uh, we have, for example, like three layers of, uh, I mean, yeah, three different layers, for example, the database, uh, the part like a middleware and the front end. And that might be because organization has a team of DVAs, a team of back end developers, and a team of front end developers. So a lot of the times, the way we end up structuring our microservices or service-oriented service, uh, systems are guided or are decided because of our organization uh, structure and not because it's actually the best way to organize our code. So the key here is that, uh, I mean, like the key property is that uh, of a component is the notion of independence replacement and upgradability. So basically, this means that the best way to know if a component has is well defined and has the correct boundaries that it should have is to think about 
what would happen if I could, if I needed to completely replace this component for another one, completely rewrite it? Will something, will, will I mean, will the system break? Will uh, it be easy to deploy it? Will it be easy to deploy it again? Will it be easy to deploy the new, uh, the new implementation? Will it be easy to upgrade this, uh, this uh, service? Will it be easy to deploy bug fixes, new features? So, as I, w as I was mentioning uh, before, services, in gen like service oriented systems or architectures uh, not only talk about microservices, which are the ones I've mentioned the most, I think. Like this type of principles apply to services of any size. Uh, there, can, there, there can be a, a couple of really big services, a bunch of microservices, uh, a, bu a, a lot of services that are medium size. I don't know if that even exists, but the point is, what I want to show with this is that uh, it doesn't matter what, what size the service you're deploying is, it is important to have this boundary problems uh, solved solve or fixed, because if not, it, like adopting this, this uh, architecture won't really help. Uh, and also because like, there's a lot of discussion about what's actually considered a microservice and what's, what's not. Uh, a lot of people just talk about uh, like abstract concepts. Some other people go uh, on, onto, onto more concrete things like counting uh, lines of code. And that's not really the, the, more, the important point here. You can call them whatever you want. The important thing is that if you're building your system with this type of architect architecture, you should, really have, uh, you should really have a clear way to uh, know where to place the boundaries in, in it. So that's why, uh, talking about, about, about this, uh, that's why I, I'm going to talk, sorry, about why I think services taste better in small dispo disposable cups or why you should try your, to design your services in such a way that you could call them microservices. So here's like, a, uh, I don't know, like the best definition I think we could, uh, f uh, I, we can find on the internet right now about the term microservices. And as Martin Fowler wrote, it has sprung over uh, the last few years to describe a particular way of designing software applications, a suite of independent deployable services. So uh, basically, this has a bunch of benefits after, a bunch of benefits basically other than just helping you uh, define in a better way the boundaries on your systems, of your systems. And one of them is that you can use uh, multiple languages. So each, services, each service story might be written in a different language. Uh, also that all code bases are isolated one from the other. Uh, and having services kind of, having those boundaries kind of put boundaries on bad design. So if a service is bad designed, well, that's a shame, but the good thing is that it's contained. I mean, like the, the bad design won't affect all the system or won't rot all the system, it will just affect that uh, specific uh, service of your system. And another good thing is that services will end up being easy to replace. So this means that, all of this means that even if you try really hard, it's really difficult to find a way to couple all of the different systems that are part of the, of the big uh, application. So basically, if you think about it, when you have a bunch of microservices, they act as Unix programs because like, they basically receive some input, process it, and pass it as, as you can do on Unix with pipes to the next program or next service. And basically, that's how it works. That's the good thing about 
having, I mean, that, if, if you think about it, that's, that's why Unix motto or I, idea of having really small programs that do really specific things is good. And if you can take it to a bigger scale, you'll gain a lot of those benefits. So this sounds really good. This has a lot of benefits, and that's all we've seen so far, but it, it's not all unicorns and rainbows, and it has some pitfalls. So one of the pitfalls, although this doesn't sound bad, one of the pitfalls is that in, o in order for this to really work good, you have to automate the deployment. But not just the deployment of one specific service, uh, sorry, application, as you, would, as you could do with a monolithic app. This means that you have to orchestrate, sorry, the deployment of a bunch of services. And you have to find the best way to do it. Uh, and you have to automate it, even if they are written in different languages. And this means that you have a lot of work to do. Also, you can have a lot of degradation issues and inter-service communication problems. And these are hard to track when you have a, a lot of services running at the same time. When you have one, only one application, it's really easy. And you can notice it really quickly, really fast. But when you have a bunch of services, it's hard. So you have to implement, uh, you, you, you have to be really good at, monitor, at monitoring every one of the services, monitoring, monitoring the communication between them and responding fast when something fails. Uh, another problem is that since you have a lot of small applications or services, each one of them has a log. So when something goes wrong and you don't know exactly where it's going wrong, you could like spend countless hours going into each one of the logs of these services trying to find where, where the problem is. So you'll also have to work to, to have a unified log for all of the applications or all of the, all of the microservices uh, in one place so that you can find all the logs even when a service is gone, even if you deprecated it. Uh, so another pitfall is uh, when you have to trace or troubleshoot uh, a bug or an issue that your system is having and the issue is happening across a bunch of microservices. So this can get to be really hard. If you don't have a way to identify when a request passed through each one of the microservices. So the easiest way to do this is just like probably to add a unique identifier to each one of the requests or, or uh, yeah, the requests your system process so that you can trace it down each one of the microservices you have. So when do you know if the application you have, the system you're working on, is a candidate to using this type of architecture? So uh, even Phoenix came up with, with this uh, concept which he called the human cognitive mass. And it basically talks about how much uh, each one of us can under, understand how a system works and how, how can that, I mean, how much information we can retain and still understand everything that's going on. So he came up with a few rules. So the first one says that no single app can be larger than the human cognitive mass and every app that crosses that limit should be broken up or just should, should get its, its size reduced. Uh, and if you think about it, this is, although like it's a really relative concept, it makes a lot of sense. Because once a system or an application is too big for a, any developer that takes a look at it or works on it to understand it, it's important that they have a chance to uh, Sorry, it's, it's, it's moment to split that 
application into smaller ones that are easier to understand and to maintain. He also said that uh, every every sufficient sorry every sufficiently complex domain will require an app larger larger than the human cognitive mass. So basically, this means that for a lot of the problems we're solving, we're going to need to build probably more than one application. Any problem that's consider I mean that's consider uh, considerably uh, big. Will need will probably benefit from adopting this type of architecture, and also uh, other than this, you have to, to take in consideration that adopting this type of architecture is going to have a lot of operational cost. So you have to to keep in mind that your team or the team that's working on the system has to be prepared for it. So you have to be good at rapid provisioning. A servers to deploy new new services or redeploying new version, versions of systems. Also, you have to be good at monitoring all of your services and at being able to rapidly deploy a service if something fails or if you need to uh, uh, just roll out a new feature. So to recap, what what we were talking about. Uh, Microservices, microservices architecture won't fix your object-oriented design problems. Uh, it will, at a, at, a, at a level, it will force uh, like your components to be decoupled, but that's just because they are different code, base, code bases, not because they're going to fix your design problems. And if you adopt this architecture, it will allow you to deploy components individually, which as at the same time, it will allow you to replace them really easily. If something goes wrong, when you, when you deploy a new feature and you need to roll back, it's really easy to do it. Also, uh, if for some reason, uh, I know you have a memory issue on the server, you can just uh, deploy, uh, redeploy your, uh, the, the same service, sorry, and just kill the old one. And it will also allow you to use different programming languages, which can be really useful because depending on what the type of problem you're trying to solve, there, are, there might be some uh, programming languages that are more fit or better, a better tool to fix one problem than the other. Uh, so it's important to know that like microservices architecture is no free lunch. It comes with a big operational cost and you should adopt it when the benefits of adopting it uh, overweigh the costs of adopting it. Thank you very much.